Welcome to Mintel Little Conversation, real conversations with actionable insights into what consumers want and why. I'm Lynn Dornblazer, Principal Consultant at Mintel, and today we're discussing weight loss drugs and the impact on the industry and on consumers. Today I'm joined with Diana Kelter, who's Associate Director of Consumer Trends, and Jenny Zegler, who's Director of Mintel Food and Drink. Now, I know based on our earlier conversations, we've got a lot to say on this topic. So um, it feels like everybody in the world, including us, is talking about weight loss drugs, all the different types of weight loss drugs. People usually shortcut and talk about Ozempic, but obviously there are many others as well. Um, But based on what we know about consumers, about behavior, about the marketplace, about the industry, do we think the food and beverage industry is going to be completely upended by weight loss drugs? I would say my, the way I like to phrase this is that I don't think that we're at a watershed or rather weight shed moment for the, because of these drugs. We have some very hot off the press uh, Mintel global consumer data. So we survey consumers in 36 different markets around the world. Because we're talking about weight loss, I took a look at the countries that have the highest po- rates of adults with obesity. So we ask consumers to agree with the statement that diabetes drugs that reduce appetite are a good solution for weight loss, such as Ozempic or Wegovy. In Saudi Arabia, 20% of adults agreed with that statement. In the U.S., it was 13% of U.S. adults, 10% of Mexican adults, and 9% of U.S. adults agree that these drugs that reduce appetite are a good solution for weight loss. And to me, that really parallels with the percentage of the population who are interested in bariatric surgery. So yes, for a small percentage of the population with obesity, this is the miracle drug. This is the thing that they have been waiting for because they've been struggling with this their entire lives. But for the majority of the population who are just looking at weight loss or weight management, they're still looking for maybe some of those more traditional ways of managing their weight. Mm -hmm. I will, I guess I'll speak to that majority of people who are just looking for more traditional weight loss management. And I'm going to come at this a little bit from more of that holistic lens since I focus on macro trends at Mintel. And one area I guess I hope this leads to in terms of upending a little bit is just a deep, we've been talking about total well-being for so long at Mintel. It's one of our trends actually. Um, and so We've been seeing the trying to make these connections between brain health, between gut health, between mental health, between physical, all these things trying for consumers are trying to find how they can work together. And my hope with a drug like this, even if people aren't per, like personally taking this drug, they're aware of the conversations. Obviously, we're talking about it. It's in the media. We're hearing celebrities talk about it. We're hearing maybe people have friends and family who are using it. And what I've been seeing is people saying it's changing the brain, the mental connection of what's triggering appetite and what makes that connection. And so if we can form a deeper connection and conversation around brain health between your digestive, um, your weight, all those connections, I think that could be a positive of just helping consumers connect those dots that we know they're trying, they're grasping to find those connections. Um, so even if we don't see consumers personally utilizing this drug, we know it's a conversation starting point. And my hope is that leads to positive conversation in some ways of those connections. Do you think that the drugs also um, are starting perhaps to help destigmatize weight loss, maybe? It feels like that can go kind of either way, but I'm wondering if, you know, to your point, Diana, of fostering more conversation, if that might be part of their purpose or their benefit, even if you aren't taking them. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that I actually was able to sit in on one of our beauty trend um, conversations yesterday for 2024 beauty trends. And I was, I felt like I was learning as I listened because our beauty analyst, Claire, was saying that there's this emerging area of, I believe her term was psychodermatology. Um, and it was about dermatologists doing a lot of science 
about the emotional connection to your skin health. And I was sitting there as a trans analyst being like, this is my brain is spiraling with ideas from this because that is what I've always think the hope should be of connecting dots. We don't, as consumers, live in silo. We are so influenced by so many external factors, which I know we're going to talk about a lot of external factors um, later in this chat. But I do think weight loss has always been such a cultural kind of conversation. It's personal. It's a very emotional thing. Um, So I do think it's asking um, a lot for people to have the the room to talk about it. But I do hope there is more. We've seen a lot of kind of things that were stigmatized become more open. We're seeing it with menopause. We're seeing it with menstruation. We're seeing it with all these women's movements. So hopefully it does create that, but it is such a a personal emotional um, topic. So I can I can get where it's kind of a longer curve to kind of change that that moment. Based upon that too, though, I feel like this is also opening up the spectrum. Lynn, when we were um, prepping for this, I love that you said like these drugs are just another tool in the toolbox. And Diana, to what you were saying, there's a personalized spectrum, there's emotions to this. And so I feel like these drugs just become another way that people, it might be the perfect thing for you, but it might not work for me. It might not work for your best friend. It might not work for the person down the street. And I think it's just opening up this more empathetic uh, conversation about the different elements of weight or health overall. And the fact that you need to find what works for you. And also this idea that we can accept whatever body we might be in, however permanent or temporary that might be. Exactly. Yeah, that whole idea of body acceptance. I know we had talked about this earlier as well. I, I too, had always been so taken by the ads, what, seven, eight, ten years ago now, from Dove about Mm -hmm. body positivity. And at that time, I had seen some of the ads in the U.S., but I'd also been in Brazil, and I saw some of the ads Mm -hmm. in Brazil. And what was so fascinating was how... Obviously, how inclusive Dove was, but how they got it so right in talking and showing one kind of set of bodies in the U.S. and a completely different set of bodies in Brazil. And so, to me, that feels like that that Dove movement was not certainly not the beginning, but is an example of that whole idea of everything is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And we see so many examples of that in... Um, culture today with uh, more acceptance with whatever you look like, um, whatever kind of person you are, it's beautiful because it's you. Um, So I think I do take your point there. I think it's, it's, it is a tool in the toolbox and that whole idea of bringing the whole self together and not it being just a focus on that number on the scale how many Mm -hmm. calories you've Mm -hmm. eaten, how many steps you've walked, you know, all of that to have it be so much more than that is refreshing. I don't know how else to even, to even think (laughs) about that. Um, But what do you think, how should consumers think about these drugs? How should they proceed when it comes to deciding, do I try to get Ozempic or Wagovi? Do I not bother? Um, What should consumers be thinking about? I think there's a really interesting kind of evolution out there because I feel like the way that it first popped on to pop culture, at least in the U.S., I feel like it really grew this fall. And there was so many undertones of like what celebrities are on this because they lost, you know, maybe at maximum 15 pounds to look really great on a red carpet. And now we're seeing more conversations about the people who have are with obesity and are are taking this and finding success, as well as the people who are not finding success. Uh, We talked a lot um, in our preparation for this, that there was a special led by Oprah Winfrey uh, that aired in the U.S. on the the beginning of this week. And she really focused on, she is on one of these drugs. She has mentioned, she hasn't said which one, um, but she really focused on this idea that it's in the brain. It's the biology that's affecting it. And I feel like that conversation helped me think more about there's so many different spectrums to this. There are the people who want to lose a few pounds. There are people who are overweight. There's people with a, who 
are obese. And then the way that that segment, that special made me think about this is that there's also people with obesity, which is a chronic disease in which you have maybe tried and failed to lose weight over time. They talked about this higher weight set point and that also you can't stop thinking about food. And so I feel like it's introducing the spectrum much like you can figure out a diet or lifestyle that works for you. But it's also encouraging these deeper conversations with your medical professionals about where you might fit in that spectrum, what type of intervention you might need. If you feel like you're one of the people on the special who said that they can't stop thinking about food all the time, maybe this drug is right for you because other interventions might not help that. But maybe there's also just, you know, something more simple. We see so many of those apps, Weight Watchers and Noom, and just heard about a new one called uh, Simple. And so like, there's a lot of interventions out there for people that I think we just, again, it's the personalization, it's what's right for you and what you think you need the intervention with. Yeah, absolutely. I was really taken by the the Eli Lilly ad that showed up during the Oscars, which talked about the weight loss drugs and this notion of losing a little bit of weight so that, that you look great on the red carpet, but that there are people who have significant medical needs for the drugs, that it's not about beauty, that it's about health. And I think that's one of those issues that is a really hard one to separate out that idea of weight loss and beauty not necessarily having to to walk hand in hand but they they are really two very very different things yeah it it makes me think because of that i mean we've seen for every generation there's a new iteration of what the beauty standard i mean and we particularly see it for women um, impacted the most when they, I mean, for past generations, it was probably flipping through magazines or on your movie screen. And for this upcoming generation, even like young Gen Zers, it's their TikTok screens. So there's just so many messages coming at them. And and in some ways, I think for millennials and um, Gen Z, it's been even more overwhelming because they're getting two conflicting messages at once that we've seen the body positive movement take shape which is a great movement of like kind of what you were saying earlier jenny like accepting your shape for whatever it might be it might be this one year another this year we age we change and it kind of evolved that message and i think that was really taking shape we were seeing retailers evolve with plus size lines we were just seeing that conversation in celebrities um being more um plus size and accepting that influencers online, but then that didn't remove that side conversation of thin is beautiful. And we were still seeing that movement grow too. And so I think in some ways it's been, I want to go with this thing, but this isn't ending. So it's like conflicting messages coming at them, which I think, and then for the people who we've even seen this with celebrities, like when they do lose weight, people feel like, oh, you turned on me because you were not uh, you were a plus size symbol and now you've gotten skin. So who is, so I do think it's a lot of conflicting messages and I'm curious with drug intervention, will that change it? But once again, it's not accessible to everyone. It's obviously, in, unless you have that specific medical need, it's not always going to be covered by insurance. And so it's going to be a sacrifice for people to afford it. And then it's a commitment, a longer term commitment to kind of dedicate yourself to um, a drug. So I, I do feel for these younger generations. And I hope the goal, once again, is that it's going to create conversation in a positive way of kind of bringing to life these conflicting messages that every generation kind of has in some version. And I know we've talked about this, like, what does this mean for men? Yes. Because they're left out of the conversation a lot too, mm-hmm. um, in terms of kind of being siloed and talking about what it means to to feel comfortable in your body or beauty standards. Men are kind of left out of that conversation. Have there been any male celebrities that have talked about being on any of the weight loss drugs? I can't think of any. Can you? I just saw a headline yesterday from the comedian Tracy Morgan, who said that he actually gained weight 
when he took it. Um, but I've actually seen in the past couple of months, because I've been watching this for a few months and, you know, the news algorithms start to feed you articles that you click on. Um, but I saw stories about the uh, Drew Carey, the actor, and he is not on one of these drugs, but he was just talking about his journey with his weight over the years. Um, I think there's another actor, the guy who was on Mike and Molly, and I think he opted yes. for um, bariatric surgery. So I feel like there's more nuanced discussions when it comes to men, whereas some of the women, it just feels like um, uh, stories about Oprah, but also Sharon Osbourne and Kelly Osbourne. And like, it's much more on that, like kind of drug side versus these are the other things that have worked for these men or haven't worked. And I feel like that's also a really interesting part of this discussion. These drugs don't work for even the people who do need them and who do try them, or they don't want to stay on them because of the side effects. So that's why we need this spectrum. That's why we need different options because you're going to find what works best for you. Mm -hmm. So we've all read with those news algorithms, we've all (laughs) read um, many people out there in the industry talking about how this is going to, how these weight loss drugs are going to completely transform the food and beverage industry and completely transform retail. What do we think about that? No. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's exactly what we think about that, but I did want, yes. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. all of the things that that you've both said really drive home that there's an impact perhaps, but not the impact that many seem to be talking about right now, given that there, it doesn't feel like the weight loss drugs are creating a significant change in behavior. And um, unlike let's say bariatric surgery, going back to bariatric surgery with bariatric surgery, as I recall, um, uh, having known people who've had it, that there are certain kinds of foods that you simply can't eat anymore because of how your body has changed, how it metabolizes. Mm -hmm. And I don't see any of those foods fading away either. Mm -hmm. And bariatric surgery has been around for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So, if we accept the fact that this is not going to, or our, our considered opinion that is, this is not going to completely upend the food and beverage industry or other CPG companies, what should companies do to participate, to help consumers, to give them more tools in their toolbox? What can they do? Um, so I do think there is something to be said about broader external factors happening right now. Um, so I was actually listening to a podcast on a totally different topic. It was about the economy. Um, but the whole episode of the podcast, it was called Plain English, was what did we miss? Like that was the idea of the podcast. Like we've been talking about the economy. I've been, the host was saying, I've been making these predictions for a year. And econ- so we're going to focus this episode on what have economists missed um, about like their predictions. And I think that's something that's a good practice for a lot of people in any industry to take kind of to just take that mindset of we do a lot of self-fulfilling prophecies um, often with the media, like the media talks about something, we start to believe this is creating this impact, and then it becomes a reality. But there's always other factors that have to be considered. So we're still seeing the wind down of the pandemic, we're seeing inflation, Um, we're seeing mental health stress um, on the rise, we're just seeing all these factors that are influencing purchase decisions, influencing decision. So when it comes back to your question of like, what should food brands and just broader categories be doing? I think it's creating choice. I think it's about creating options for people. Um, because like you said at the beginning, Jenny, this is going to work for some, it's not going to work for others. And I think they need to just create whether it's more options, whether it's some that have included protein, because maybe you need that from your food nor- more, or maybe people are who are struggling with mental health need to reframe convenience because their days are so stressed and they need a reframe on how, what a convenient meal looks like on their dinner table. Um, and we've talked about with food kind of being that part of like the little treats people are being, maybe other categories can embrace little treats for people who don't want to always turn to food. Um, so I think it's about choice and flexibility. That's my kind of take there. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think it's reframing some of those ideas. Like we talked, we had a trend in 2023, I think it was a global food and drink trend called unguilty pleasures that consumers did not want rules around their foods. They just wanted to be able to eat what felt good. We had been through some really stressful times. We didn't realize they were going to continue. I think we thought we we hoped we were out of that. Um, But I like this idea of if we're exploring more the biology behind what you think about food, But also, Diana, what you said about beauty, where there's these psychological and emotional factors. So often you'll hear people's stories when it comes to grief or stress or anxiety, and they go to food. Food's always there. Food doesn't judge you. And you can kind of, you know, let yourself go in it. And I feel like if there are opportunities as much for choices in food and portion sizes and the ability to find that treat, but also if we're deprogramming this idea that food is a comfort and food is a solace. What are those other options? Um, That concept of little treats, you know, can I treat my new sneakers as a little treat and take myself out for a walk? And that's a little treat. Can I, um, one of my favorite things is the Aldi finds aisle. I feel like they've got such a, a great selection of stuff for affordable prices. So could I buy myself a plant or a, you know, household decor item or a new piece of clothing for an affordable price in that section that's my little treat. Like it, it, there's just this way of thinking about things and this self-care notion and this holistic idea of taking care of yourself that food has been a great option for, but it's not the only option. So there's still ways to kind of fit in with people. And if people are trying to put themselves on a healthier path, no matter what that looks for them, I think there's ways of other brands fitting in beyond just food and drink. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When it comes to food and drink, do you think we need to companies need to think about today's version of the 100 calorie pack or to have options that are the high calorie options and the lesser calorie options or you know so thinking about what food and drink can do mm-hmm. are those some options or or what do you think might be the best way forward for food and drink companies I portion control to me is number one because that's the easy solution. We've always had that for weight management. It works for anyone at any time. That to me is not a loss. Like that, that's definitely the safest bet. Um, protein, because a lot of people generally accept protein as something that's helpful for weight management or weight loss. It will also help people who are on these drugs maintain muscle mass. Um, but there's also fiber and specific forms of fiber that um, are being heralded it as nature's Ozempic, quote unquote. Um, so just ways of f- keeping yourself full. So again, it would work for people who are interested in weight management at some way, shape or form, but aren't on the drugs. Um, and I think it's also just that idea that maybe we want different sizes and different options. And um, I've kind of mocked it for a little while, but I feel like the evolution of um, seeing cinnamon toast crunch in like every aisle of the grocery store, like maybe this is actually some form of that. Because if you can't, if you don't think you want one form of cinnamon toast crunch, you can go to another aisle and there's another one of your favorite cinnamon sugar flavors that maybe you can find a way into this that does work for you and whatever goals you might have in mind. I think one of the best examples of that, although it's never been positioned as on the spectrum of calorie control, but this idea of choose the size you need for Mm -hmm. the occasion for which you need it, which Mm -hmm. is a good way to think about it, is what we see with so many of the carbonated soft drink brands, Mm -hmm. where you've got a three liter and a two liter and a 20 ouncer and a 12 ounce can, and then you've got the little cans as well. So whether or not it's a a sugared version or a sugar-free option, it's, you know, choose the size that answers the need that you have. And I know for me, I could really, I could really see benefit, for example, in more activity, thinking of, um, thinking of my kryptonite, which is potato chips, um, uh, more variety in terms of multi-packs of small bags Mm -hmm. or different sizes of small bags, depending on what the occasion is, you know, to, Mm -hmm. to give consumers that choice. If you need just a little bit, I, and, and you do see a certain amount of that, but it feels like 
to your to your comment about portion control that there's so much opportunity there that is unexplored by companies. There's also the education behind the scenes too, right? Like we provide you all of these different sizes. You know, they, we've got the party size bag of potato chips, which implies you're having people over. <laughs> Let's say, I'm not saying that's the way people use it. It's not the way I've used it in the past. <laughs> Me neither. Me neither. But I feel like there's... The, the idea that these drugs are miracle drugs and that they're, you know, people are just not going to be eating anymore because we're just going to be injecting ourselves with these things belies the fact that even in addition to these drugs, you have to have some sort of better eating habits as well as exercise habits. And that in so many countries is just indicative of the fact that we still need to learn those healthy habits or they're hard to keep up with. You know, you, you had a certain metabolism when you were a kid and you had recess and you could burn off anything you ate and then you reached, you know, the working age and maybe you're in a sedentary job. And there's all of these different factors that I think providing the options is a great tool, but also kind of encouraging consumers to think about when they need that. We've talked about mindfulness so much, but I feel like it's still teaching consumers those habits and reminding them of it that we do still need in addition to, so they know which option to choose, which path is right for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I also think food brands, especially in drink brands, need to not just focus on the medical drug innovation, but what's happening in technology from like a biometric standpoint. Because I always like to think about how impactful having your heart rate on your wrist became. Because I think back to the 90s, early 2000s, when we didn't have that, that wasn't, no one knew what their heart rate was at it. Like personally, you would know when you went to the doctor. Um, and suddenly then there was workouts created around tracking your heart rate zone and just knowing what your heart rate was. And it kind of connected it to these broader goals from a fitness perspective. Um, so that was more fitness rated, but suddenly people had this data at their disposal that was very personal. Some people are like, I've learned I have a low resting heart rate. I learned I have a high rate. Like I've learned what that, and then there's all the studies of how that impacts your metabolism because if you go to the red zone, then maybe it burns, all that science. And so obviously we're going to at some point see another major innovation in biometrics of what it enables you to know about your body, whether it's glucose levels, whether it's hydration levels, whether it's, it's just going to be impactful. And I think the more that food and drink brands get ahead of what people are going to have on their wrists, um, the more prepared they'll be to say, we have the solution. You know what your level is. So you might need this product. Um, and it's going to be about personalization in that level because a big theme we've talked about is there isn't a one size fits all in this space. The drug, the Zempic might work for some, but not others. Diet and exercise might work for some, for not others. But when you have personalized data on your, your wrist, it can give that confidence. Like, okay, I know I need this product. And it gives you almost a personalized, like dietitian kind of thing. Like this mm -hmm. is the, what I need. This is the product. So I really think food and drink, you can't look at tech as a separate industry because it, everything comes full circle. Yeah. I think we've we've talked a bit about it, but I feel like it's the, to me, this is a tipping point in terms of the acceptance and conversation of many different types of bodies. And the idea that, I mean, Lynn, you mentioned the Dove Real Beauty campaign. I think that is a beautiful brand example of someone who took something, I mean, that's not necessarily only about soap and shampoo and conditioner and the brands that they sell, um, but it's about acceptance. And I feel like we're at this point and these drugs open up a new landscape. There's only going to be more of these drugs that come out that we need to deprogram our current views and our attitudes and our terminology about weight and have this acceptance. There was one of the mothers who was in the Oprah special was saying that she has learned new vocabulary and new ways of supporting her daughter as she learns to love her new body. And I thought that was just such a wonderful way of whatever that new body means for you, that acceptance. Um, I, this is from a Peloton instructor that I listened to on a podcast, but she was saying that she doesn't like the phrase best self. She promotes uh, favorite self. 
And I felt like that was a wonderful way of like whatever age you might be, whatever, you know, wherever you might be in your life. This is my favorite version of me. And whether that's in a bigger body or a smaller body, I just think that we are, these drugs could be easily, and I think we've seen some of this, you know, stigma of like, oh, we're going to go back to like heroin chic bodies and everyone's going to have to be super, super skinny. But this could also be a great time to open up the language and the inclusivity about this so that people are doing what's best for them and helps them love themselves more, which as the people who love and support them, you want to you only go along on that journey with them. And as someone who's just walking past someone on the street, we don't need to judge them. We don't know their path. Mm-hmm. Or someone who's writing, you know, celebrity gossip headlines. Maybe we don't need to throw around that judgment of people's weight. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, only, the only other final thought I would add is I think it's important to also focus on a separate epidemic that's happening, which is the loneliness epidemic. Um, one of our 2024 global consumer trends is relationship renaissance. We are seeing this loneliness epidemic. And obviously, if you're feeling isolated, you've said it, Jenny, food is a comfort. You're probably, when you're stressed and feeling isolated, you're going to turn to food. And so I think it's important to see how this innovation, this tipping point will change. And food is part of socialization too. Like that is such a cultural part of, and it should be like, that's a, it's fun. It's cultural. It's enjoyable. Um, but could we see people maybe, if they do use this drug, feel more empowered to go out and know their brain is kind of more um, designed, if they're on this, to know like their limits and just enjoy the moment a little more, be a little bit more present maybe? Or could it be like more people are going for walks as that treat, like you said, Jenny? So I just think it's um, this is one impact but it could have an impact on what we're seeing with like how people socialize and connect and hopefully for hopefully for the better i'm going to be optimistic um Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. it it gives them more empowerment to socialize Mm. well so i think diana and jenny we could talk about this forever (laughs) but we won't right now um but there are so many big things that we've talked about. There are just a couple that I want to highlight for our listeners to really be thinking about. Um, Jenny, I'm really taken by it, by the comment you made of, of maybe um, these weight loss drugs as part of a, a more holistic approach is a way for people to help become their favorite self. I think that is such a great phrase. Uh, But the reality is, as we know, um, weight loss is so Mm multidimensional. It involves so many things linking to that larger aspect of well-being. So all of the weight loss drugs are simply one tool in the toolbox. And we know from from some of the data that, that we have at Mintel that not a huge percentage of consumers think that it's a tool in their toolbox, uh, which I think is absolutely fascinating. But to get a little more practical in terms of um, uh, some key takeaways, it feels like there are some big opportunities out there. One is to increase the conversation around weight loss with men because the weight loss drugs seem to be focused a thousand percent just on women and women aren't the only ones who want to lose weight might be very different for men. There's a lot of exploration that needs to be done, but I think that's a a very important opportunity. Another opportunity is for non-food and drink companies to think about those little treats to give consumers that, that, moment of happiness uh, for a job well done, which can be a wide variety of things. But for food and drink, there's some really good practical things. Portion control, protein, fiber, and then also keeping in mind how consumers are tracking everything these days with, with biometric data and to understand what's going to be next and to figure out for food and drink companies to figure out how to link to that new and upcoming biometric data. So for everyone out there listening, thank you so much for uh, coming with us today on this conversation, but it doesn't end here. So if you go to Mintel's LinkedIn and Instagram, please let us know what you think because we'd love to hear your thoughts about weight loss drugs. If you want to know more about Mintel, visit Mintel.com, sign up to become a member of the free Mintel Spotlight community. 
Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever it is you get your podcasts. So goodbye for now, and we'll catch you next time for a new episode of Mintel Little Conversation. Thank you. Thank you.